I don't know why, but a few years ago I said, uh, I do actually like ducks. I like ducks a lot. American Wigeons, greatest bird ever. But a few years ago I said, I like rubber ducks. I didn't even like rubber ducks, but I said I like rubber ducks. And people gave me about 50 rubber ducks. I still have two of them on my desk. I have more rubber ducks. I love ducks. I don't trust anybody who doesn't like dogs. That's it. American Wigeons are the greatest bird ever. What about seagulls? Huh? What about fishes? Yeah. Pelicans. 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 Pelicans are really cool. Oh, wait, second greatest bird. The greatest bird, royal terns. What about royal terns? What about blue footed boobies? Huh? Blue footed boobies? I've never seen a boot. So they're like they're the street pigeons. They're not like the street pigeons. They're like the street pigeons. Pigeons are pigeons are feral pigeons are pretty amazing, but I have to like them. All right. So a couple things really quick. For some reason, it didn't post the assignment or the notes that I've also said to put up a little bit. I gave you from the review book and the six questions. And for some reason, it didn't post because somebody didn't push submit. I know. Can you believe it? But it is submitted now, so it's there. And did everyone do the multiple choice? A couple of questions I know were a little weird, but they didn't standardize that. So I think it's good practice to start thinking about it. So the Pax of Boys in Western uh, North Carolina has a relation to Baby Rebellion. And I don't know if it actually asked a question on that, but it's good review to go back with that. The one I really wanted was uh, four, five, and six. We wanted to stand back. And hopefully, when you read that, you found, I remember to stand back. If you didn't, then you have a lot of review to do. <laughs> and then that led directly to the declaratory act that said, Parliament uh, said, we can back anytime we want. And so I hope people did okay on that. You know, I know it's going to be a little bit of review. I will do that again in a couple days. Today, I don't know, just, you know, just like six months, it's not a big deal. We just start to go back and review. Next Tuesday or Wednesday, I will do my first review session. We'll do it on Teams. It'll be in the evening. Let's go about midnight. <laughs> no, I'm thinking it's got to be relatively early evening, six or seven, I mean, just like an hour. I'll come in, I'll go online, and I'll answer any question you have on the first four pages of that review time. Any question you have. So I'll let you know exactly what day, and I know if you have conflicts, I'm sorry. You know, we got three classes. I just have to come up with the time. I will record it. And did I tell you how I would answer the questions in the form of interpreted days? And so I'm already getting limber. I'm loosening up. You guys are going to be wowed by this. No, just click the little eyes or go through anything on that review pack if you want. Yes. Yeah, send me a question. And so send it to on chat and I'll get it. And, and so any question you put up, I'll answer about an hour. You know, I'll just go through as many as I can do. So that's my way to help you guys as much as possible on that. And the big thing too is once you start hearing it again, you kind of get like, oh yeah. It's amazing how that happens. So what oh, sprinklers? Oh, hey, the boy up is pretty yay, we got sprinklers. It's spring. It's like 30 degrees outside. But it's spring. <laughs> By the way, everyone cross your fingers. It's supposed to be in the 60s on Saturday. And I have big plans. I'm going to go look at ducks. Okay, so. Oh, the DBQ then. The DBQ will be on Tuesday. And I will give you the documents on Monday. Because we have short periods. And you, you, can, uh, you have to turn it in and brainstorm out on a thesis. You have to have all that in. And. Uh, yes. Huh? I just don't do it on Monday. Huh? Because it comes after Monday. So yeah. And something else I was going to say. I can't remember more. Oh, so you have to do four paragraphs again. You have to do an opening paragraph and then your three body. Your three body. That means six stocks. You have to do a closing. All right. So let's go take out notes and let's go to finish where we're at. I'm starting a little behind. This side was not doing it. Yeah. Just trying to get our hands. There was a thing on Western Seal about the very ninjas and knights. Yeah. I'm with it. This one. 
So talk about the outside, first case of the, uh, the Jews. What was Hitler's book? Mein Kampf. Yeah, Mein Kampf. It's not only is the, the toxic, horrible ideology, but it's almost impossible to read. But Hitler was obsessed with syllabus. I've got to be very clear about it. Not saying something with the army, what happened in the army. But uh, laid off. You blamed everything on Treaty of Versailles. Okay, the scapegoats. Who is the number one scapegoat? Okay, communists were the one that had the most impact across Germany. To Hitler, it really was Jews. Does that make sense? Yeah. And and most people, you know, there was this was an intensely racist time, as I said before. There's anti-Semitism all over in Germany, but that was only just like, oh yeah, we'll blame Jews because we blame Jews for everything, but the communists and scapegoats. Uh, you know, the, the leader principle, the mods, you know, the mods will, all people working together. What was the idea of living space? The dots will is the people. Living strong. Living strong, yeah. And that would be this kind of indirect idea of attacking Germany then, or attacking Russia, attacking Germany. Well, <laughs> they kind of did it in a way if you think about it. But, oh, what big event happened that propelled it to the power? Well, he became chancellor. Someone said, I heard the Great Depression, and then he won. So, one thing before, before the last talk to Carl, which are exactly right, but they made him chancellor when the communists and socialists actually gained power. They're like, oh no! And they asked him to form a government. So, livestock burned down. Do we know who did it? No. The Dutch, yeah. Dutch communists, as well, he might have been involved, but it's very, Hitler could have done it. And that and the, that a hole in the constitution that allowed for this. Oh, what were the camps they created? Who was in it? Political prisons. Yeah, these are political prisons. And we'll get to more of that later. So we got right to here. So Hitler would get rid of the SA. He never really had full control. It's called the Knights of the Long Knives. But they a private personal guard that he controlled called the Stockstufel. Just basically means special detachment or the SS. And these would become, let me make sure this is all recording and all is good. All is good. These would become the concentration camp guards, uh, in many ways symbolize Nazi Germany. As the war went on, there were more and more, uh, the SS would become more and more of a military unit called the Waffen SS. And they were, for the most part, fanatical fighters. Who they be well equipped? They took month, they took actually equipment from the real German army, and gave it to these fanatics. Not very well led, but fanatical. And um, in many ways, to what happened to the Soviet Union, they really they, they put Nazi Germany and the SS together. Let's put it this way: the Soviets did not consciously take SS men prisoner. Period. And if you know what happened to the Soviet Union, you can understand their point of view. And the leader of it was this horrible man by the name of Heinrich Himmler, right here. And this horrible little toady was a single bit to Hitler, but he, more than any other person besides Hitler, would be responsible for the treatment of occupied areas and the final solution. You know, so I want to make sure that besides Hitler, Hitler had very little to do with the actual day-to-day -day operations of it. That does not absolve him. He, of course, was responsible 100%, but Hit Himmler ran it. Himmler would commit suicide after being captured by the British in May of 1945. He hid a cyanide uh, glass um, little jar in his mouth. And did it. He had it hidden kind of in a tooth. So with that, the Gestapo was their secret police. So here's Gestapo. Here's... Uh, the actual Berlin Braver Police. And the Gestapo, though, for the most part, were the secret police and the most feared secret police run by any Herman Goering. By the way, the German Shepherd dog. And in many ways, that would become associated with uh, Nazi Germany, too. When I was a little kid growing up, I had a neighbor who uh, he was a POW. He was captured at the Battle of the Bulge in December of 44. He was POW, the German POW was captured for about five months and four and a half months. And his hatred of German Shepherd dogs was he would kill everyone. Uh, 
Gargoyles. I know he didn't, <laughs> but they were the Gargoyles. So I can't help but see German Shepherd. I think about him, and it makes me sad that the dog is blamed for that. But yeah. So with that, oh, this is the headquarters in Berlin, and it was destroyed in Allied bombing in March of '45. But the basement, they just have this kind of this rubble, and then the basement that's left is one of the best museums. The topography of terror, it's called in Berlin. It's amazing. If you get a chance to go to Berlin, field trip. Off of the yellow school bus, let's go. Mm -hmm. So with that, but the big thing Hitler, Hitler concentrated on was getting Germans back to work. That's why we have the labor brigades all marching with shovels. I know it's amusing, but the same, I like that. They, they look like we're carrying our shovels and they go run a mile because they all are wearing um, shorts and tank tops like they're an athletic brigade. But they begin to build these massive buildings. And Nazi architecture was a little like socialist, realist architecture in the Soviet Union, big granite or cement buildings. A lot of them survived because they're like bombshells. So this is the Luftwaffe headquarters in Berlin, and it survived. Not without these horrible fascist statues. They're gone, but it's still there. Hitler's uh, office in Munich, where they did the Munich conference, survived. Now it's an art school. Which I find very ironic. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And so this is a post, you know, building. You know, Hitler is helping us get back to work. And of course, the Autobahn is the most famous. And what kind of economics would this be? Deficit spending, get people back to work. This is Keynesian. Which is ironic, Keynesian who was very much a Democrat, but doesn't mean people still didn't use his ideas. And I love, uh, uh, if you've been on the Audubon, we mentioned this in class before, the Audubon is pretty amazing. They would cover most of the country, but part of it was justified to mil move troops around. Just as the interstate highway system in the United States, that was uh, late 1950s, part of the justification would be not only move troops around, but to evacuate cities in case of nuclear war. Which, of course, if you've been on interstates in big cities, you know that evacuation would take months. Mm -hmm. But it's like big city, like Billings. Yeah, I know. It's a big city. But, and of course, we have to have a picture of Hitler over and over again reviewing the brand new Audubon. And I included this picture because I liked it and it was ironic. And it's just a few years later, about a decade later. This is end of March of 1945. Anybody know what this is? It is the Audubon. What's that? Yeah, these are German POWs marching back to the West and these are Americans with that. I thought that was a good picture to add. But the Audubon is still there. And he also wanted a car for every person, like a radio or the television I mentioned before. And this would be the people's car in German, the Volkswagen. And he personally helped design this. Here is a ceremony for the Volkswagen. That never really happened, but the plan was for every German could have a cheap car that they could buy on credit. Um, the thing was, after the war, the cast and the machine tools to build this survived the war. And these were in the West, Frankfurt, that area around in Western Germany. So they started to build these cars because they needed to start exporting stuff. And the Beetle became kind of a hit, kind of an underground, you know, uh, almost like a counterculture thing of the 50s and 60s and helped rebuild the German economy. Kind of ironic they used this design for a cheap car for, for uh, good little Nazis. <laughs> but the big thing is, this is how unemployment just came. The German economy grew. And so Hitler got the country out of the Depression. And once the Nazi Party took power, the Nazi Party was tiny when the Depression began. It started to grow a little bit. Then look how, how fast the Nazi Party grew in the first decade. Hitler, without a doubt. Okay, first off, to get any jobs, you had to be a Nazi. But... Hitler will become, because of this getting rid of unemployment and making Germany feel good about itself, Hitler, and we got to get to the Hitler poster, will become probably the most popular leader Germany had ever or will ever have. Which is sad in many ways, but I think I mentioned this before. To this day, the most popular leader in Russian history, Stalin. And so, no, he did not start rebuilding or rearming. They pushed against the Treaty of Versailles. They built civilian planes that had dual purpose. 
but they didn't really start rearming. He wasn't willing to do that yet. He was pushing against it. So who knows where things are going? But let me tell you one thing really quick. Here's a couple nice little propaganda posters for the children that started indoctrinating early. So this is for all girls join the Hitler Youth, and youth serves the Fuhrer. And by the way, generic uh, um, Aryan look with Hitler looming in the rear, quite creepily, I would argue, but there. And the propaganda would be pretty big against very de uh, much degenerates of trying to destabilize white German culture. Here is Blur blowing up the tree that has the various like German liberal movements, book burnings of liberals, and of course, degenerate art like Impressionism and modern art, abstract art, which is just new. And so we're going to look at how, look how evil they are. But the most of the propaganda would be Jew. And Jewish, anti-Jewish propaganda, anti-Semitic propaganda would grow and grow and grow when Hitler was in power. And so that's where you get this idea of this evil, sinister Jewish cabal, who is a combination of both animalistic and subhuman and brilliant and clever and going to destroy the world. Your Schumer was the... Uh, anti-Jewish Nazi paper, and yes, Hitler was a big fan of Henry Ford. Henry Ford was intensely anti-Semitic, and Ford liked Hitler. But the law we need to know is the Nuremberg Law. In 34, a series of laws, we just need to know they deprived Jews of their rights. And the whole goal was to take this small percentage of the German population, maybe 1.5% of the population who were Jews, and make a leap. That was the goal. Get them out to immigrate. And about half did. Unfortunately, this was at a time of intense racism. The United States would not allow Jews into the country. Remember I mentioned this before, the National Origins Act of 1924 had a very strict quota of almost no Jews allowed. This was an intensely racist time in the U.S. too. So most of the Jews who fled, fled to Very sad. And here are brown shirts in front of Jewish stores. Here they are standing in front of a, a, a Jewish owned Woolworths, which was kind of a, a small little department store. And they're yelling and um, slogans and trying to intimidate people from going in, drive them out of business. When people think of the, the, the horrors of the final solution or the 1960s known as the Holocaust, that's when that term came about. Uh, that happened in the areas that the Germans would occupy, would conquer and militarily control most of that. Now, to diminish what happened to the Jews who remained in Germany, and a lot would be murdered, but most of that what we think about would happen in Poland or the Soviet Union, or areas they would take, including France, or when they would occupy Italy in 43. So with that, one thing I have to add, the 36 Olympics, Hitler got the Olympics in 36. It was a big way he could show the superiority of fascism. Now, there's a myth that Hitler was very disappointed about what happened in the Olympics. That's simply not true at all. By the way, the hurdler, that's a very clever British cartoon, I would say. The Germans, Germany did fantastic. Just amazing. Almost double the gold medals of any other country. And there was a lot of Nazi propaganda, but it was toned down. Hitler. Um, when somebody else won a gold medal on the first day, he left the ceremony for that. And they told him, you can't do that. Either you have to stay for them all or leave. So he left for all of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so Jesse Owens was an American sprinter who did win one of the 200, uh, 400, uh, and relay. <laughs> That's right. Relay. You win the relay? Yeah. How slow. But, yeah, relative. There's Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens was an American sprinter. And this is going to become a myth in the 30s, 40s, through to this day that um, Hitler was disappointed because Jesse Owens lost. Yeah, he was annoyed. But Owens did win it. And I thought this was an amazing picture. That's the 100. Here's the 200. And so we have a Japanese. The national anthem, or basically, flag was coming up, and it's pretty common to salute the flag for anybody. That would start ending after World, during World War II. 
But I thought the German who got second looked pretty interesting right there. The fascist salute that came from the U.S. Very weird, ironic things going on. And this would be held up as an example of how the United States, a more open society, um, could defeat ultimate racism that was Nazi Germany. And this really did hit something. If you're going to attack Germany, this is an American history class. Remember, this is the era of Jim Crow. This is the most racist time in American history. This was a time of redlining. Jesse Owens was not treated as a hero when he got back to the United States. This would be a myth after the war. And to be honest with me, it kind of infuriates me. And in fact, Owens would be reduced to doing things like to make money. He would go and race racehorses, which is just humiliating, as, as you could imagine. Um, I mean, Jesse Owens in horsey beat. And so, as every country has problems, the U.S. had their own. We cannot diminish that. And the reason why the United States got to the war, into this war was not to fight ultimate racism, as much as a lot of people would like it to be, including myself. So let's get to the road to the actual war. So we're going to do this really fast, really fast. So war happened then Vietnam. All right, American history, we're done. Good luck on the test. All right. Now to wall sits and bar Ooh, wall. Should we just do bar hands now? We should do wall sits instead of chairs for the test. Four hours. These are uh, German soldiers going through that's the symbol of cold. And here's a bit of German propaganda. Here's more German propaganda. I'm being totally surrounded by enemies coming to kill us, partially because of Versailles. And this would be one of the things that Hitler would say, we have to rearm. But a series of events happened before that we have to get to very quick. First off, in the 20s, there were efforts to try to stop the arms race that led to World War I. The two months uh, that I think are important to know, in 23 was the Washington Naval Conference. The US was not totally isolationist, even though they weren't in the league. And this was gonna limit the size or the limited number of capital ships. Remember those big battleships called dreadnoughts? That was kind of the arms race. So it limited them as in for every five battleships called capital ships that Britain and the US had, Japan could have three, Italy and France could have 1.67. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Two thirds of a ship would not be seaworthy. It's a ratio. Ratio. Now, this is implying Japan might be mad. Actually, Japan was actually pretty satisfied with this. Remember, the US has two oceans to Japan. Britain has an all empire. Japan, just around Japan. Germany, no ships, no battleships because of the Treaty of Versailles. Now, this tried to limit the arms race. Another one was called the kellogg briand Test. And this would make war illegal, essentially. If everyone signed it, they're acknowledging that wars of aggression are illegal and cannot be allowed in a civilized world. The problem with this is, let's say somebody signed this treaty and then they went to war anyways. How do you stop them from aggressive war? <laughs> yeah, very, I always envision the, the, Swiss, the Swiss police coming. Because the League of Nations was in Zurich, so the Swiss police come those local. Um, police cars and those comical to my ear European siren, you know, ee, 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 and they arrest the army. Okay, but <laughs> did you like the siren? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good, right? Maybe I'll do it again for you. Yes. Why was France limited to 1.6 ships? I thought it was Well, France, France was more focused on their uh, naval power, and so their point of view is they would rather be limited to that, so they don't feel the need to build more. Oh, and so they would spend all their money on building a massive army. That would, of course, be shockingly poorly led. <laughs> so, and then at 31, also because of the Depression, Japan, ravaged by the Depression, decided to get their own raw materials. In fact, their army did it. This was not done by their civilian government. It kind of ended the civilian government. But in 31, Japan invaded Manchuria, which was a quasi-independent country under the blanket of China. China was involved in civil war, so it's kind of divided up into little fiefdoms and warlords. But the League, remember the League of Nations? 
did nothing, and the U.S. wasn't part of it. Yes, the U.S. would send a strongly worded message saying don't, <laughs> but what do you do with a strongly worded message? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. You know. And so here's your Japanese internet, and here it's going, the Japanese is blowing through all of the different agreements. So this would turn out to be lead to a series of mistakes by Japan, but doesn't that tell other countries that might want aggression? You know, no one's going to stop you. So for example, in 35 and 36, Italy, to revenge what happened in Ethiopia in 1894, attacked Ethiopia. Now, who said he wanted to show their militarism and how tough they were? Ethiopia, a massive country, but had a you know, poorly equipped, poorly trained army. And so the Italians took it. The League did nothing. And I should add, once again, here's Italian troops in Ethiopia. Got to have the, uh, the poster of Mussolini. You don't, can't escape Mussolini's poster. Poor Ethiopia. Uh, Britain, South Africa would liberate it in 41. But, so once again, the League of Nothing. So there's, oh, I like this one. Oh, first off, he used mustard gas. Yeah, what Mussolini did there was, was horrific against troops that did not have gas masks and were not trained at all. But I like this one. Here's Britain and France. And look what they're doing to Mussolini. No, you shouldn't do that. And what's you? Yeah, well. Now, Mussolini knew Italy was not strong enough for the war. This is more just, I'm pecking away. But other countries might have learned from this. While this is going on, Hitler decides to press against the Treaty of Versailles. Remember, oh, almost forgot some. While this, another thing, the Spanish Civil War. This erupted a massive war against Republicans and those who wanted dictatorship. A bloody, awful war. Awful war. That Spain has never really recovered. In fact, there's talk again about Barcelona, the Catalonian region, breaking away, forming their own country. But the Republican side, would be the government that was trying to be overthrown by a military dictatorship, and even though most of the West indirectly supported it, they were a popular front of various kinds of liberal groups or one in the Republican government, including socialists. But because of France, especially and especially Britain, they were timid, they didn't aid. Only the Soviets sent limited aid, and only to some communists. A bunch of like Americans came over to fight their anti-fascists, and they joined, they called it the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And they joined, but they, they were ill-equipped, ill-trained, um, brave, smaller, but well-equipped would be the fascists. They're also called the nationalists. And their leader is Supremo, Francisco Franco. And Franco's forces have the great advantage of this. There's Franco, there's Franco after Madrid fell finally to the nationalists. Franco, who was fascist, had the great advantage. Italy and Germany helped immensely. It was Franco, the Germans and the Italians. The Germans sent some troops to big thing though, the Germans sent planes. They were just starting to convert civilian planes to military, not very effective, but the beginning to start to build uh, military aircraft, including dive bombers here. Uh, Stuka literally means dive bomber. Early in the war, they were incredibly effective. And then they realized, why are we shooting back like this? And they lost effectiveness. Here, the Italians sent over troops, ten, over 10,000 troops. And in fact, a Republican stronghold at a place called Guernica would be bombed by the Germans in one of the first examples of true terror bombing that everybody feared since the development of total war. We'll talk about that in total war. But they tried to kill as many civilians as possible using dive bombers and other bombers. Here's a couple pictures of Guernica. Here's a picture of two Spanish children who are hiding uh, in the rubble under a house. And they hear, this is taken at the exact moment, they hear they hear an uh, engine flying over. Worried it might be another bomb. It's a really terrifying and sad photo. Pablo Picasso would make one of his most famous works of art, the great impressionist and cubist artist, who painted uh, millions of paintings. 
But his painting of uh, Picasso's painting of Guernica is one of his most famous. A flat picture on a screen does not do it justice. But some of you probably seen this painting before. And it's supposed to show the confusion and hell in Picasso's mind of not <laughs> the confusion and hell of Picasso's vision of the bombing of Guernica. Thank you. Thank you for that in his mind. <laughs> I, I really like Picasso. This is in Madrid. Uh, so I've, not, I've actually not been to it. I've not seen this one, but only pictures of it. But the Nationalists did win. And the Franco and the Fascists would be in power in Spain until 1976. Rapidly anti caucus And this made it look like fascism with this new and invincible power. That the old liberal governments like Britain, France, and the United States had made them look. How could they marshal up the forces? In fact, a lot of people said the only way we stop them is to take another new power like the Soviet Union. I should add, who would ally themselves with Franco, the fascist, by the 1950s? Anybody want to guess what country? The United States, because they're anti-communist. So we would ally ourselves with the fascists. They were so devastated by World War II, uh, much to Hitler's chagrin, Franco did not join the war. Thankfully, that could have been tough. But, okay, okay remember Versailles. All I have to read in front of Versailles is this area of Germany. Germany could not help the troops there, the Rhine, because that was a buffer zone between Germany and France. But after what happened, the weak reaction to the Civil War, doing nothing about Manchuria and Ethiopia, Hitler sent troops into, where are we at it? Troops into the Rhine. March of 1936, it's called militarizing. Now, he was scared to death about Britain and France. Brit what if Britain and France decided to enforce the treaty? France had a standing army of 1.5 million men, well equipped, well prepared, well, pretty well equipped. They still, um, the problem with when you win a war, you think you understand war now? Mm -hmm. And so they were really well equipped for 1918. They weren't quite ready yet for 1936, but neither were Germany. Germany didn't have an army at hardly at all. This is them crossing over the bridge. This is the bridge of Remagen, by the way. Hitler had orders. If the, if the French do anything, run away. If the French would have crossed over to stop this, Hitler would have had a humiliation that probably would have changed the course of history. This would have been a big deal. But the French, the French didn't want to act without Britain. And Britain, in the throes of depression, was like, it's not worth the fight. The Rhineland's part of Germany. Are we going to fight so Germany can't put troops in Germany? Now, if I say it like that, like, would you be willing to fight and die so a country can't move troops around their own country? But knowing what's going to happen, it was a terrible mistake. Terrible mistake. This emboldened Hitler. In fact, Hitler would not begin to rearm openly until this. This is huge. And here he is, I like this one. It's like, you know, trophy, honey, honey trophies. And what's Hitler's new trophy? The Treaty of Versailles. It's a clever cartoon. That's after the run. And here they are stepping on. So with that, this is what we call a peace, giving into aggression. Hitler was aggressive. Hitler was an opportunist, an audacious, who would try anything. Not many people accuse, um, confuse this with intelligence if it kind of works. Because it kind of worked at first, then obviously did not. But that's when they began, right after they began conscription. Remember, that was the draft. And they began to rebuild their army. They were doing it in secret, but now in the open. They had these small little um, tanks that they were constructing in secret that came out in the open. They had a, um, pretty good fighter planes that were just developing coming out in the open. So here are German troops. But German propaganda laid out that they were building troops, they were ready to fight now. But in secret, they all knew that the German uh, general staff told Hitler, we'll be ready to fight a war in 45. The war that Hitler wants against the Soviets. In 39, over 90% of their transport, their transportation, was still horse-drawn. 
and it would be like that for the whole war. Germany was not ready for war in 39. And that should all give us a pause, because they still almost won. A couple things happened, they could have won. So, this would eventually, right after that, you're going to have in 1938, the Rome-Berlin Axis, the Vault the Pact of Steel, and this was an anti-communist alliance. But then, in 1940, this would become the axis between Japan, Germany, Italy. Italy, Germany, Japan, right there. So you hear the axis powers is those three. And what unified them? Anti-communism. And it's pretty interesting how um, all three nations had ideas of racial superiority, that they all unified. It was not an iron alliance. Mussolini was more just, uh, uh, this was blustering for him. He didn't want war, but then he would foolishly join it and and his and would end him. So in 38, it's called Anschluss. Violated the Treaty of Versailles, Germany unified with Austria. Austria, now a small country, German speaking, they are unified. Austria trying to be great again. And this is Germans and Austrians, one people, one nation, one leader. Entering Vienna right there. What did the powers do? Nothing. So then he turned his sights to Czechoslovakia later on that year. And Czechoslovakia was a republic. There were some issues in Czechoslovakia. It's not there anymore. It's Czechia. You also see it called the Czech Republic, you know it's called Czechia. Um, I still sometimes will say Czechoslovakia because I grew up with that as a country, Czechoslovakia. I still sometimes will say West Berlin and East Berlin. I grew up with it, it's just, it's ingrained. I know most of my life it's been the other way. Well, most of my life, born 1920. My age changes all the time. Depending on how I feel that day, you'll find out. But they were powerful, they had a powerful army. An arms industry, here are Czech soldiers. They had defenses all along their border with Germany, and that's what they look like then. They're still there. If you have cement walls between five and ten feet thick, they don't go anywhere. So you can go visit their forts. They're, they're, I gotta admit, I, I find them really interesting and creepy. But Germany wanted this area of Czechoslovakia right here in black, where my mouse is called the Sudetenland. Now, we saw this in the video. The ethnic Germans there, they're being mistreated. Hitler said, I will declare war. Now, they weren't necessarily being mistreated, but Hitler used that as an excuse. Here are Sudeten Germans trying to break away from Czech chains with the light of Nazism behind them. And you know, these, these were German-speaking people who had never been part of Germany. They're part of the old Austrian Empire. But Hitler says they must come in. Now, like this, this is a cartoon from a, or a, cartoon, a map from Time magazine. Czechoslovakia about the side of the floor. I just thought that was kind of cool. So I had to put that in. Well, you can imagine how the Allies thought. They panicked. They did not want war. In fact, they were just also realizing, boy, Hitler. Germany So they panicked. And so here is Britain and France, their leaders, Chamberlain and Zaladi, are threatening, will fight and trying to show they're tough. But actually, they're trying any way they can to avoid this. They guarantee Czech security, but they're trying to avoid this. In fact, the only person who wants war, I think literally the only person besides his cronies, was Hitler. Hitler said, I want war, even though he knew his army wasn't ready. But this is going to lead to the Munich Agreement. 1938, Hitler of Germany, Mussolini of Italy. By the way, Mussolini warmed himself in. He's the only one who can speak French. He spoke five languages, so he can speak French, British, and German. Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Great Britain right here, and then Delatier of France. And Delatier thought, we're going to have a war. We have to do it, let's do it. But Chamberlain would sign or do anything to get out of this. And here's Hitler signing the agreement right here with Mussolini behind them. And Hitler tried, I mean, Hitler said, we have no choice but to go to war. 
And these, Galatia reluctantly, but Chamberlain pushing it. They said, Hitler can stab the Sudeten life. And then Chamberlain put a piece of paper in front of Hitler. In fact, I've got this out of order, but it's right here. Hitler signing it and said, Hitler would agree that's all he wants. He'll stop it there in the Sudeten line. And Hitler's like, yeah, sure, I'll sign the piece. Give me something else to sign, I'll sign it. And so Chamberlain was seen as a hero. He saved the world from war. Hitler was actually disappointed. But you can imagine what happened with that. Who wasn't there? The Czechs were betrayed, without a doubt. And Stalin was furious, and he realized, okay, he didn't like Britain and France anyway, but now he really didn't trust it. France at that time was trying to get an alliance with the Soviet Union because of Germany. And Stalin's like, eh, I don't know. So here's the leader of Czechoslovakia right here, basically toasting his death almost. And then here they're meeting, and there's Stalin looking at them. I thought that's a funny one. But Munich is going to become the definition of appeasement. In fact, just the term Munich will mean appeasement. Just Munich. Chamberlain coming off that plane and waving that piece of paper. In fact, the second time he's ever been on a plane. Waving that piece of paper, um, home over and all, and die, <laughs> just half black, half gray. That was the style for prime ministers in their 70s. But Munich would become the symbol. Now, here, I want to be clear about it. The only chance they had to stop Germany was the Rhine. That was a chance. But after the war, oh, we're not going to watch this. After the war, throughout the Cold War through today, Munich will become an example of um, a ways to try to get, they're going to turn to the United States, the United States to get involved militarily around the world. If we don't stop communist aggression, you name it, we must, or it'll be another Munich. If we don't stop the communists in South Vietnam, it'll be Munich. If we don't stop the terrorists in Afghanistan, it'll be a Munich. And yes, that was you. If we sign a nuclear agreement with Iran, Munich, to this day, it's said by people who probably don't even know what happened at Munich. By the way, if you go to the meeting where they signed the agreement, like I told you it's an art school, and the office where they have to be signed is the principal's office. And it's really, it, you could go up, you could, he'll let you into his office. Well, it's, it was me then, I don't know if it's a chi now, but it's really cool. On that note, leave my presence. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Don't forget. Oh, check your take-home test. Most people did quite well on it. I was very pleased. As you should be. Have you seen Delmar? Yeah. It's very good. I liked it. It, it was a little... Um, a little kind of convoluted. He has this thing, you know, the way he tried to keep that. Yeah. But I, I definitely enjoyed it. That's for sure. Oh, another thing is, if you, uh, if you didn't know what happened there, you'd be very confused. Yeah. Yeah. I... Finished it uh, the second test yesterday. Sorry, that was good. Alright, I'll get it. We'll see ya. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. It cuts off like after It's not on at all. No, it is. It just starts like. Oh, missed the first few minutes? Yeah. Oh, shoot. It just Where do I start? Uh, you know, I had a power. Something happened to my power. My power went off at home and I flashed. And I wonder if it quit recording. Instead of being like uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah like Thanks a lot. Well, then. 
Oh, hyperinflation. Everybody, quick, take your notes out. Let's do hyperinflation really fast. If you didn't miss it, I'll do it really quick. Thank you for telling me. I didn't realize that. I'll just mention it very quickly. So we didn't have this. You guys didn't get this yesterday if you no. looked on YouTube? No. That was a good job to do. Yeah, I, I can vividly remember this. I was, I was in the first few minutes of class, and there must have been some kind of like a little power surge in, in my neighborhood, but my, my computer jumped, and it stayed on. But, and you know, to be honest, I never even checked again, but I wonder if it, it happened like four or five minutes into class. I remember because it scared me. And then you said something about that, and then you said that for like sort of Oh, you're kidding. I mean, it scared me because it was like, boom, oh, it's our flashback. Okay, so, oh, and then for some reason, the assignment from, you know, I was going to do the notes and those six multiple choice questions. Uh, they didn't get posted because somebody who remained nameless, but once again, I'm blaming Alexander, did not hit the word submit. I know. Can you believe? 